So good to see everybody this morning. It's a wonderful day. We always look forward to each and every opportunity that we have to come together here with our brothers and sisters in Christ and worship God. It's a time we look forward to all week. And I am so thankful that we are able to be here today to worship God. There are people around the world that for various reasons do not have the privilege that we have of doing this today. There are many that due to sickness or other reasons are not able to gather with their brethren. And we never need to take for granted these opportunities that we have to be able to come together to glean that encouragement from each other, being with those that we love, those who are of like precious faith. This is a time that we eagerly look forward to each and every week. If you're visiting with us this morning, we want to extend a special welcome to you. We invite you to come back and worship with us here at Pyburn Street any time that you may have the opportunity to do so. And please know that you are our honored guests here today. In the spring of 1621, the pilgrims had landed the Mayflower at Plymouth. And they almost immediately began enduring a very harsh winter. During this winter, disease and sickness run rampant. Of the 102 original pilgrims that landed at Plymouth, 47 would die over that first winter. As spring set in, their situation was not much better. People were still sick. They were beginning to have second thoughts about whether it was really a good idea to come to America or not. They began to think that they would have been better off to remain in England. But two unlikely characters stepped into the scene. Two Native American men came to their aid and began to teach them how to live in this new world taught them farming techniques, taught them the natural foods that they could go out and gather for themselves. Well, by the time that the autumn came around, their situation had greatly improved. Their health was much better. Their knowledge was much better. And they decided to throw a great feast of thanksgiving. And they observed what we have commonly come to refer to as the first Thanksgiving. We fast forward 168 years from that time. A new nation has been formed. We have fought for our independence from England. And the United States of America is a young country. Congress passed a resolution directing our President George Washington to declare a national day of thanksgiving. And in his first thanksgiving address, he uttered these words, that we may then all unite in tendering unto him, folks, he's talking about God, in tendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for the signal and manifold, mer <clears throat> excuse me, manifold mercies and the favorable interpositions of his providence. But it would not be until the end of the Civil War, nearing the end of that war when victory was in sight, Abraham Lincoln declared that the fourth Tuesday in every November, the fourth Thursday in every November, would be a day of thanksgiving. But it would be 80 years later before this would become a national holiday. This took place in the 1940s. And from that time, on the fourth Thursday in every November, our nation sets aside a day as a day of thanksgiving. A day that we are to focus our attention upon all of the blessings that we have as residents of this nation. But I want you to think about this from a spiritual perspective for a few moments this morning. 
Whenever we read through the pages of God's Word, we find the subject of thanksgiving time and again, especially in the book of Psalms. The psalmist writes in Psalm 105 and verse 1, to give thanks to the Lord and call upon His name. Psalm 106 and 107 both begin in the same way. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Ephesus, he wrote these words in Ephesians 3 and verse 20, always, there's the key word there, always give thanks to God the Father for everything. Then Paul also instructed the Christians in Thessalonica in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18 to give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you. Give thanks in all circumstances. The passage that Brother Wayne shared with us in our scripture reading just a few moments ago comes from one of the more familiar psalms, that being Psalm 100. And I want you to notice these words with me once again as we enter into our thoughts for this morning. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves, for we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. What we find in this psalm is the basis of all thanksgiving. Because for the child of God, thanksgiving is not just one day out of the year. Thanksgiving is not just something that we do when we pray to God. Thanksgiving is something that is every single day of our life. It is a way of life. We are to live a life of thanksgiving to our Heavenly Father. Another way that we might put this is this is our daily exercise. This is something that permeates everything that we do as a child of God. The way that we live, the things that we engage in, we are always expressing our thankfulness to God. That God has allowed us to be who we are, to do what we do, to live as we live. For these are all blessings that have come down from our Heavenly Father. But we see in this brief psalm three points that I want to share with you this morning. First, it tells us that we should be thankful to God. It tells us who we should be thankful to. But also it tells us why we should be thankful. Why do we express our thanks to God? And lastly, how do we do this? How do we express that thankfulness to our Heavenly Father? Well, let's start out by talking about who we are to attribute our thanks to. We look at these first two verses, and here it tells us that God is the one that is to be the recipient of our praise. I want you to stop and think for just a moment. We are told that the day of Thanksgiving, what we're going to observe this coming Thursday is a day that every citizen of our country is to set aside as a day of thanksgiving. Who do atheists have to be thankful for? I mean, think about that for just a moment. Who do those who do not believe in God, who do not have God in their life, who do they have to attribute their thankfulness to? Themselves? Their fellow man? The story was told about two women who were walking on a trail through a, a beautiful forest this time of the year. The leaves were turning. It was a beautiful time. One of these women was a Christian. The other was a strongly outspoken atheist. And as they were walking along, the woman who was an atheist, she turned to her friend. She said, you know what? I am so thankful for the beauty of this day. And her friend that was a Christian turned and looked at her and said, Who are you thankful to? I mean, think about that for just a moment. 
who are we really thankful to for the blessings that we have in this life? Well, there's no doubt that the psalmist knew who to be thankful to. For the psalmist tells us very plainly that we are to attribute our thankfulness to God. Make a joyful noise unto who? Unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. God is the one that we are to praise. God is the one that we are to thank for the blessings that we have in this life. But not only this, we notice in verse 3 he goes on to say, Know the Lord that He is God. Now there are many people in the world around us today that are telling us that either there is no God or that the God that we serve is not the true God. Well, the psalmist tells us very plainly, no, the Lord. The Lord is God. The God that we serve, Jehovah God, is the one true God of heaven and He is the one that we are to be thankful to for the things that we have in this life. Continuing on, we come to verse 5, and the psalmist tells us also another attribute of God, and that is the fact that our God is good. You know, many times we see people when good things take place in their life, they'll make the statement, God is good. But I really wonder if we stop and think about just how powerful that statement really is. Because I look around this room today and I see good people. I do. I look around this place, I see a good building. I look outside, I see a good day. But to put God in that same category would be downplaying the true goodness of God. Because when we think about the goodness of God, we see 100% faithful goodness. There's nothing evil about God, nothing sinful about God, not even anything questionable about the character of God. Yes, each and every one of you that's here today, I think you're a good person. But we all have our shortcomings, don't we? We are imperfect people. No, that does not mean that the majority of our attributes are not good. It does not mean that we're not a good person, but we are not a perfect person. When the psalmist says that the Lord is good, what he means is that everything good originates from God. So many times we see those who are going through difficult times in life and they want to blame God. Well, why is God causing this? Why is God doing this to me? God does nothing evil. Let that sink in for a minute. If something bad happens in your life, it's not because of God. If something bad happens in your life, it's either because of Satan or it's because of your free will. We have free will to direct our steps in this life. And sometimes when we let our free will take over, then we make decisions that we don't need to make. We get ourselves in situations we don't need to get into. But also, when we give in to the snares that Satan puts in our path and bad things happen. Folks, that is not God. God is not tempting us. God is not putting evil into our life. But God is good in the fact that God gives us a way of escape. He gives us comfort. He gives us peace. He gives us the ability to overcome those things that happen in life. Yes, we're all going to face hard times. We're all going to face difficult days. Yes, we're going to face those times where we disappoint ourselves, we disappoint others, we disappoint God because we sin and fall short of God's glory. But God's love for us is such that He's willing to forgive. He's a God of all comfort, a God of all goodness. God will carry us through those difficult times. Everything that comes from God is good. It is not until man gets involved that things can go bad. 
Everything that God ever created. You go back into Genesis chapter 1 and you look at each of the days of creation and as it got to the end of that day, it says, and God looked upon His creation and what? He saw that it was good. His creation was perfect. But then sin entered in. But everything that comes from God is good. God looked upon his creation. He saw that it was good. When he got to the end of those days of creation, he looked at all of his creation and he said it was very good. But also Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good. But he continues on, to those who love the Lord. All things work together for good to those who love the Lord, those who are called according to his purpose. But I also want you to notice a statement from James. James tells us in James 1 and verse 17 that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation and no shadow of turning. Every good gift, every perfect gift has come from God. God is good. He is all good. And He is the one that we are to be thankful for. But also we read in verse 5 of Psalm 100 that God's goodness and love is something that is everlasting. God's goodness is never going to end. It's never going to leave us. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be available to us, pouring out His blessings upon us. God is not an entity that is good one day and bad the next. God's goodness is not situational. God is a just God and everything that God does is good. Now, looking at it through human eyes, we may not say that some of those things are good when we think about things such as judgment, things like that. But when we look at it through spiritual eyes, we look at it at the sense of bringing about, facilitating those things that are good and holy. Everything that God does is good. He is unchanging. He is good all the time. Regardless of what our personal circumstances of life may be, God is always good. And God is also faithful all the time. When God tells us there's something that He's going to do, God is going to do it. 1 John 1 and verse 9 says that God is Faithful. This is continuous action being used here. God is always faithful to us. Now we can't say that about people, can we? People let us down. People lie to us. You know what? Sometimes we're not faithful to God. Sometimes we're not faithful to others. Sometimes we're not faithful to ourselves. We cannot say that man is always faithful. We cannot even say that a machine is always faithful. It may work good for a while, and then it's going to break down. You're going to have to go and get parts, or you're going to have to scrap it and get something new. But God is always faithful. And we need to be thankful to God and express that thankfulness to Him for His faithfulness to us. Secondly, why should we be thankful? Well, Psalm 100 and verse 3 says that it is God who has made us. God is our creator. He is our shepherd and we are the sheep of his pasture. One of the most powerful images that we find in God's word displaying the relationship that is to be between God and man is that of a sheep and the shepherd. In fact, whenever we look at the animal kingdom, there is no closer relationship than that which existed between a sheep and the shepherd. Now, I know that many of you here today have pets. You may have a dog. You may have a cat. You may feel like you have a special bond. But it's not the same as what would take place between the sheep and the shepherd. The shepherd provided tender, loving care all the time, was there with the sheep. He led the sheep. He nourished the sheep. 
When they went astray, He brought them back. He was there to observe. He was there to correct. He was there to guide. And this is why David wrote, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because this is what God does for us. God is there extending that tender, loving care to us. He guides us. He protects us. He corrects us when that's, best, when that's what is required. Because of who God is, then we have the ability to be thankful in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in this life. I found something that I wanted to share with you today. And I wish I knew who the author of this is because I think it uh, brings out the subject of our lesson so well. But I want to share these words with you. It says, I'm thankful for the taxes that I have to pay because it means that I'm employed. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little snug because it means that I have plenty to eat. I'm thankful for the shadow that watches me work because it means the sun is still shining. I'm thankful for the lawn that needs mowing, the gutters that need cleaning, because it means I have a home to live in. I'm thankful for the utility bills, because it means I stay warm in the winter and stay cool in the summer. I'm thankful for the complaining that I hear about our government, because it means we have free speech. I'm thankful for the person who sings off key in church because it means that I have the ability to hear. I'm thankful for the dirty laundry at home because it means my loved ones are close by. I'm thankful for the alarm going off in the morning because it means that I'm still alive. And I'm thankful for the weary, aching muscles at the end of the day because it means I've been productive. Because of who our Heavenly Father is. Because of the blessings that He has given to us, folks, we can find reason to be thankful in any circumstance we face. Now even though many of these things that I just read to you, we really don't like all that much. I don't like having to pay taxes. I don't like having to do laundry. I don't like having to pay that utility bill, especially in the summertime when it's pretty high. But then we stop and we think, what would we have if we didn't have those things? So how do we express our thanksgiving to God? Well, the most obvious way we do this is through prayer. We're instructed that when we pray to God, we're to let all things be done with thanksgiving. I've encouraged you in the past, and I'll do it again today, sometimes sit down and offer a prayer to God and don't ask God for anything. Have you ever tried that? Simply sit there and pour out your heart to God and thank God for the things that you have in your life. but also one policy that I always try to follow is I don't ever ask God for anything until I thank Him first. We express our thanksgiving to God for the things that He's done for us, those innumerable things. God has blessed us in ways, folks, that we don't even comprehend. We need to express that thanksgiving to Him. But let's come back to the psalm that we're looking at this morning. Psalm 100 shows us another way that we express our thanksgiving to God. Verse 1, make a joyful noise unto the Lord all ye lands. This is talking about worshiping God. Worship is an expression of our praise and our thanksgiving to God. Now I want you to stop and ask yourself this question. How do you respond when someone gives you something or does something nice for you? Typically we respond by saying thank you. We show our gratitude to them in some way. Well, what does God expect? God expects us to show our gratitude to Him. Well, the way we show our gratitude to God is by worshiping Him. 
by praising Him. When we come together to worship God, this is an opportunity for us to join our voices together, join our hearts together, and with singleness cry out to God, thank you for all that you've done. Verse 2 says to serve the Lord with gladness. In another psalm, Psalm 122 and verse 1, David said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Psalm 118 and verse 24, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. But then we come over into Acts chapter 2 and we read this about the early church. It says, they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Very simply put, what this is saying is that we as children of God should be glad people. We should be the happiest people on the face of this earth. Are we happy to be here this morning? You know what, it's okay, you can say amen. Are we happy to be here this morning? Yes, we are. We rejoice, we celebrate that we have the privilege of being children of God. We have the privilege of having had our sins washed away. We have the privilege of being able to call each other brother and sister. And who do we have to thank for that? Our Heavenly Father. Matthew Henry was a Methodist preacher who lived in England. And once while he was traveling to one of his preaching assignments, he fell among thieves. They robbed him of everything that he had, left him with just the clothes on his back. Many people would have been very bitter having had something like that happen. But that evening Henry went home and he got out his diary and he wrote these words. He says, I'm not angry, I'm thankful. I'm thankful that during all these years of traveling, I've never been robbed before. I'm thankful that though they took my money, they did not take my life. And though they took all that I had, they did not take much. And finally, I am thankful that it was I who was robbed and not I doing the robbing. What beautiful sentiments. What a beautiful attitude to have. But we need to ask ourselves this morning, what are we truly thankful for? Oh, we have so much to be thankful for. Each of us here today, we could probably sit here all day and never be able to recount all of our blessings. We sing a beautiful song sometimes, count your many blessings, name them one by one. But I love the statement in that song, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. When we really stop and consider everything that God has done for us, it will cause us to cry out in thanksgiving. We cannot help but be grateful to God. But are we willing to express that? Are we willing to do that through the way that we live our life? Are we living a faithful Christian life, a life of proclamation that we believe in God and in Jesus as His Son? Are we displaying our thankfulness to God by submitting to His will? Are we worshiping God as we should? Are we serving Him as we should? Today we have a wonderful opportunity to pause and reflect upon our life and the way that we're living it. As we sing our song of invitation this morning, we need to look inside, look into our hearts, for only we can answer that question for ourselves. Are we truly living the way that we should? Are we truly living a life of thanksgiving to God? Are we rejoicing in those blessings that are there? Are we attributing it where that is due? This morning, if you examine yourself and you find that as a child of God, you've not been living as you should. You've strayed from the truth. 
You've allowed sin or discouragement to enter into your life and to pull your faithfulness away from where it needs to be. This morning, come back to the Lord. As I mentioned just a few moments ago, the Lord is our shepherd. He is tender, loving, and caring for us. He wants us to come back. If you've gone astray, you better believe He's looking for you. He's searching, waiting for you to come back. Will you do that today? Or it may be that there is someone here who has never obeyed the gospel. You've never submitted to the will of God, placed your faith in Him. Then we would encourage you this morning that if you do believe in God and in Jesus Christ as His Son, that you'll turn away from the ways of this world, that you'll set your sights on things above, repent of those sins, come forward. Confess before this group of people that love you more than anyone else in this world. Confess that faith that you have in Christ and be baptized. Have your sins washed away. God will add you to the church today. Begin living that faithful Christian life. This morning, if you examine yourself and you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, please come while we stand and sing. All things are ready. All things are ready.